Good morning. Welcome to the Illsoy Advisor webinar on soil organic matter, a fulcrum with many forms and functions, brought to you by the Illinois Soybean Checkoff. My name is Kendall Riskadal, and I will be moderating the webinar today. A couple of housekeeping items. If you included your CCA number when you registered for this webinar and you stay with us for the entire presentation, your number will be automatically submitted for one CEU in soil and water management. If you are listening to a recording of this webinar, you will need to go to the Certified Crop Advisor website, log into your account, and apply for a self-study credit. There will be an opportunity to ask questions during the webinar by submitting your question using the chat feature. There will be a time for question answer at the end of the presentation. Please keep questions brief and only to one point. Without further delay, I'd like to introduce Joel Groover. Dr. Groover is the Associate Professor of Soil Science and Sustainable Ag at the Allison Farm. In addition to teaching, Dr. Groover is the Director of the Western Illinois University Organic Research Program. His research interests include conservation cropping systems with a focus on cover crops and organic grain production, soil organic matter, and innovative teaching methods. Take it away, Joel. Okay, thank you very much, Kendall. So I hope all of you can hear me very well. I will do my best to speak for about 45 minutes and then we can have some Q&A and I hope to have some really interesting um, dialogue after this presentation. So as mentioned, I teach at Western Illinois University in the School of Agriculture and we would love to have you or young people in your life, but it doesn't matter what age you are, we'd love to have you come be part of our program here at Western. I think we do one of the very best jobs of providing the technical information and also the science and also the practice and how it all fits together. So in my title, I used the word fulcrum, and this was a term that I learned from my dad. He he enjoyed this quote, give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum strong enough and I will move the earth, said Archimedes. How does that relate to agriculture? Basically, I think of organic matter as a fulcrum that can help us leverage our inputs and technology costs into yield. Now, a fulcrum can allow us to basically have our lever be more effective. We can reduce our technology and management costs or potentially increase our yields or both. And of course, what's really important is not yield, but rather increasing return on investment. And what I will try to present clearly today is how organic matter and our management of organic matter can have that fulcrum effect. When discussing organic matter in my classes, sometimes I show this video. This is a short video about uh, technology for mapping, doing precision ag mapping of organic matter. And I think this quote from the president of Veris Technologies is a powerful one. So organic matter is an indicator of past productivity. And another related video, he talks about organic matter is essentially a very long term, maybe a thousand year yield map, cumulative yield map, he says. But it's not just an indicator of the past, it's also a driver of future yields. Maybe some of you are old enough to have seen some pretty dramatic increases in soil organic matter. Well, maybe not organic matter, maybe yield. You've probably seen the grain yields increase dramatically on your farm. And if you're like this older guy, maybe you've even seen the yields triple. And then, of course, you might have to uh, answer some tough questions if you're bragging about the, the yield increases. This little guy has a, a tough question there. Has our organic matter tripled? There's no question we've had tremendous increases in yield. A more difficult uh, graph to, to uh, I guess, relate to is the graph of what has happened to organic matter. And the fact is the graph of organic matter is not anything like the graph that we see here of yield increases. 
In fact, if we take a look at the era of modern agriculture, that's what this study did in Iowa. They looked at 82 soil, profile, soil profiles, and they looked at the historical description back maybe 50 or more years ago when they first described that soil. And then they looked at the current condition, and they looked at three different classification systems. And they found that basically as much as as much as a third of the soils were no longer classified as black soils by current description methods. Basically, they had lost the properties that they originally had that would qualify them as a prairie soil. Related work, this was done by Jessica Veenstra. She looked at soils across Iowa, looking at whole soil profiles over 60 years of change. And what she found was that significant areas, hilltop and backslope landscape positions, had much thinner soil than they did 60 years ago with less soil organic matter. But of course, there were some areas, catchment areas, that had deeper topsoil with more organic matter. So it's not uniform that we've lost organic matter. It's simply a, a greater increase in variability that I think we have to deal with. So why hasn't modern agriculture had a more favorable impact on organic matter? Very simple way to think about whether it be organic matter or our finances, the balance, the long-term balance between inputs and outputs defines how much we have today. We can think of organic matter that way. We can think of inputs as the organic materials we grow in place the materials that we redistribute on farm, that could be animal manures. It could be materials that we import from off farm, biosolids, for example. Losses, of course, are materials that are taken away, maybe by harvest, maybe by decomposition. And of course, loss to erosion is also a major reason why our higher landscape positions have less organic matter. Now, modern agriculture, of course, has produced much, much higher yields. So let's think about this. Does it make sense that we would have lower organic matter levels if we have so much organic matter coming in in the form of residues? General rule of thumb is that the grain, the stover, and the roots each comprise about one third of the total biomass. Of course, we take away as much of the grain as possible. We think about a 200 bushel per acre corn crop, that's adding about two-thirds of the total biomass being produced, or about 10 tons per acre of roots and stover, equivalent to about 1% of the weight of an acre plow layer. So if we had no losses of that biomass, no decomposition, no erosion, we would have a 1% gain in organic matter by growing a 200 bushel corn crop. So what really happens to this biomass? Well, the reality is that most returns quickly to the atmosphere through the process of decomposition. Typically, more than 75% of crop residue carbon is back in the form of CO2 within a year. What, of course, is left behind would be residues that are still plant, count, plant compounds that haven't decomposed yet. Of course, some of those plant compounds have been turned into the bodies of living organisms that are eating the plant compounds. And then, of course, we also have new compounds that have been synthesized by the living organisms in the soil. An interesting focus of current soil organic matter research is how plant compounds are getting transformed into microbial compounds. And this is a, a very important area of research on soil organic matter. So let's just think about these high yields. We're, we're producing high amounts of residue. How is that impacting the soil? Well, the reality is that when we return more residue to the soil, the soil microbial community, the soil food web, or you could say the soil stomach, is impacted. When there's more residue returned, we actually have more decomposition. Practices that enhance crop yield, such as increased nutrient availability, improved drainage, liming of acid soils, those types of practices that increase crop yield, they also 
change a soil's metabolism, a soil's ability to digest crop residues. One of the formative articles that I read, and this is not a research article, this is an opinion piece, was back in 1995, an opinion piece or a commentary called Conventional Row Crop Agriculture, Putting America's Soils on a White Bread Diet. I don't know if you've ever thought about what a white bread diet is, but a common um, phrase that we hear these days is a high carb diet, and we hear people talk about some of the negative impacts of a high carb diet by growing high yields of grain, and exclusively grain, we are putting our soils on a, hot, a high carb diet. That's the diet that most of our soils receive. We need to think about, are there symptoms, not necessarily positive symptoms, of that high carb diet? Now this article was written back in 1995, and of course there's been Lots of research since then. I mean, 95 is more than 20 years ago. What have we learned since 1995? Well, one thing that's interesting is there has been a surge in soil organic matter research since 1995. If you take a look there in terms of the number of published articles, we have a lot more published articles recently than back when that commentary was written. So what I'm going to do now for a major portion of this presentation is review some of the recent developments in soil organic matter research and see whether we are starting to figure out what's going on, why our high residue inputs are not building more organic matter, and what the real opportunities are for building organic matter. So kind of the basic story of organic matter, and this is what I learned more than 20 years ago when I first started thinking about this. We have known that organic matter is a complex mixture of living, dead, and very dead organic matter for a long time. That's how I talk about it with my students, the living, the dead, and the very dead organic matter. The majority of the organic matter is this very dead material. It is still decomposing, but it's decomposing much more slowly than the recent residues and the actual living organisms that collectively we can call the biologically active organic matter. The old organic matter that is decomposing much more slowly and has become much more connected to the mineral part of the soil, historically we call humus. One of the riddles that's being investigated now is, does it matter if these recent residues are plant materials that just haven't decomposed yet or whether they are of microbial origin? Does that matter? And how does management impact the transformation of plant materials into microbial materials? And does management impact how that transformation results in stabilization of organic matter versus decomposition of organic matter? A very interesting article that came out just last year is the importance of animalism in microbial control over soil carbon storage. I think we've all heard of anabolic steroids, for example, that help build muscle. When we think about microbes, normally we're not thinking about anabolic processes, we're thinking about catabolic processes, processes of taking things apart, of decomposition. But the reality is that to build soil organic matter, we need to think about the anabolic function of microbes as well, the fact that they are building microbial compounds that actually interact with the soil differently than plant compounds. This particular article, a very prestigious journal, lays out something that they call the microbial carbon pump. And they basically talk about the role of microbial production of compounds in their stabilization. And they talk about this stabilization as an entombing effect. The idea is that the mineral soil can encapsulate or basically capture and protect microbial compounds differently than plant compounds. They talk about two major pathways by which microorganisms influence the stabilization of organic matter. What I have written in the green all that technical terminology is basically that microbes take apart 
plant compounds. And the stuff that's left that hasn't been decomposed is more stable. It's kind of like the bones are left over after the meat has been eaten, you know, by the maggots. All right? You have the bones that are more stable than the meat. But the other process here in the red is a process of microbes eating organic substrates and making new compounds, biosynthesis of new compounds. And both of these processes are involved with the turnover and stabilization of organic matter. But a growing body of evidence indicates that the process of microbes making new compounds is actually more important than just the process of the microbes eating the meat and leaving behind the bones. Another graph, or sorry, a diagram from this article is related to this balance between the entombing effect, the protecting effect, and another effect they discussed, the priming effect. The priming effect is the stimulation of decomposition by fresh additions. When you add fresh organic materials to the soil, it revs up the microbial community, and you get more than just the fresh materials being eaten. You also have greater decomposition of the older organic matter. And when you have more of that priming than you have entombing, you have loss of organic matter. When you have more entombing or protecting than you have priming, then you have stabilization of organic matter. This is another article, very recent article, that discusses the same basic concepts and the idea that's laid out here is that the persistent soil organic nitrogen is, <laughs> excuse me, it's not just the old materials that have escaped, you know, being eaten by the microbes. It's not just the bones. It's actually largely materials that are made by microbes that should be edible, but instead of being eaten, they are interacting with the soil minerals. They're getting encapsulated in the soil aggregates and they're being protected. So it's not just the chemical composition, which we used to think that certain plant materials, like lignin, the stiff stuff that holds up corn stalks, we thought those materials would accumulate in soil and become organic matter. Now we're realizing that those materials get eaten. What's more important is when the microbes make new materials that get trapped by the mineral part of the soil, and then we have stabilization. And we're actually learning that certain types of microbial activity are more important for making compounds that stick to the mineral surfaces and get encapsulated. So basically the idea is that we have different levels of connectivity between soil organic matter and the mineral matrix of soil. Some of the organic matter has not connected to the mineral part of the soil yet, and that's free organic matter, still little pieces of residue or big pieces of residue that haven't connected. Some of the organic matter is stuck right on the mineral surfaces. And that's what we call mineral protected, and that's, that's the really older organic matter, the stuff that we historically call humus. But there's also physically protected organic matter that's little flakes of residue. Sometimes we call them particulate organic matter or pulm. And that particulate organic matter is encapsulated inside the soil crumbs, the soil structure. And so there's lots of interesting new research basically in the time frame since the um, article about the white, the opinion piece about the white bread diet, it's really looking at where the organic matter is going in soil structure. And it's not just chemical composition of the organic matter that matters, but rather it's where it's going and is it becoming protected by getting stuck on the surfaces, mineral protection, or getting stuck inside the soil crumbs and physically protected. Now a very interesting article that um, that came out two years ago looks at how the amount of residue being returned and where that residue is returned impacts the efficiency with which organic matter is getting stabilized. And this article actually found that if you have more 
above ground carbon, you actually have lower rates or lower efficiency of long-term carbon stabilization. What, what, what does that mean? What, what they found basically was that there were these priming effects. If you have really high above ground residue inputs, you had these priming effects stimulating decomposition that resulted in less long-term stabilization. But when I read this article, I started to think, is this a potential explanation of why high crop yields sometimes, or actually often, do not result in much change in organic matter? That having this high residue input above ground is not resulting in retention because of the priming effect, that it's stimulating the decomposition process. And so even though you have more input, you also have more rapid decomposition. This is a, a diagram from that article, and it basically makes the point that high above ground residual inputs equals low efficiency of organic matter stabilization. Now, they also looked at below ground inputs, root inputs, and they found that there was a different effect. If you have high below ground inputs, you actually get a stabilization of organic matter. Another related article that I think starts kind of tying these ideas together is that certain crop rotations lead to more organic matter retention, more accumulation or building of organic matter. And it would be overly simplistic to think it's just the rotations that grow more residue. Because the fact is, we have crop rotations with high yields that are growing lots of residue that are not building organic matter. What this review article concluded was that when we have perennials in our systems, like alfalfa, for example, or perennial grasses, when we have cover crops, winter annual cover crops combined with summer annual crops, basically when we create systems that have greater perenniality, we seem to have more organic matter retention. We don't necessarily have more total organic residue input, but we have a greater efficiency of stabilization. So we need to be looking for opportunities to increase the perenniality of our crop rotations. Exactly what does that mean? Well, basically growing more green stuff, and of course not just above ground, but also roots, during more months of the year. And that, that's not necessarily uh, changing our current crops. That may be simply adding in winter annual cover crops. So how do we monitor whether we're having the effects that we want? How do we measure what matters? You know, if we are going to measure what matters, we're going to be able to start to understand the connection between the different forms of residues coming in and their functions. And this is a very interesting article that came out a couple of years ago, and it basically identified several, several different methods of measuring organic matter, not the total organic matter that you, that you commonly get from a soil test, but measuring two fractions. One was the permanganate oxidizable carbon, and one was mineralizable carbon, carbon released during a short-term respiration or short-term incubation. So basically, the, the amount of, of CO2 released when microbes are allowed to incubate in the soil. And what they found was that these two, these two measures actually indicated different things. The permanganate oxidizable carbon, it reflected practices that were building or stabilizing organic matter. Whereas the mineralizable carbon, the carbon released during a short incubation, was a reflection of mineralization or you know, release of nutrients as residues are breaking down. The fact is we want both of these things to be happening and we need tools to be able to monitor both of these things. And this is an article that makes, makes it clear that we do have some fractions of, our, of the total organic matter we can measure now that are useful indicators. In terms of measuring the mineralization, this is a test that some of you have probably heard of, the Solvita CO2 burst test. 
basically the CO2 release during 24 hours after wetting a dry soil. This, this is part of the, the Haney soil test, soil health test. And this is a, a pretty simple test to do. I, I do it with my students. For example, students in my soil properties class, I have them bring in paired soils, crop field soils under standard management, and then very close by the fence row soil. And what, what we find consistently is that the fence row soils have much greater soil respiration when we wet a dry soil and we look at how much CO2 is produced during the next 24 hours, the fence row soils are consistently higher than the field soils. Are the fence row soils receiving more residues? I don't think so. Obviously, there is plant productivity if we have a fence row that's growing a perennial grass, for example, but there's probably more residue input into the field, but there's more microbial respiration when we wet the fence row soil. What's going on? Well, the reality is it would be great if we all could do tests like the Solvita to you know, tease out these types of differences, not just comparing fence row versus field, but comparing different practices in the field. But the Solvita test is kind of expensive. It's, it's about $10 a test. There are actually other types of measurements of soil respiration that are much cheaper. And so this is one that I'm doing some testing of that's actually about one-tenth the cost of Solvita. And this, this is basically a, a method of looking at how the CO2 changes the pH of a pH indicator, a color pH indicator. So the CO2 it dissolves in the solution, carbonic acid forms, and it changes the color of a pH indicator. So maybe there are some much cheaper ways that we can measure this respiration. Maybe there are ways that we can standardize the testing of soil digestive ability. This is an interesting global project where they are actually comparing different types of tea, as in tea that you, you know, make a beverage out of, and you take these tea bags, you use a standardized procedure, you put them in soil, and you look at change in mass of the tea material over a set period of time. And so it, at thousands of sites all across the planet, mostly actually in natural ecosystems, they're evaluating how different soils have different digestive abilities. And they're comparing a green tea that decomposes more easily because it has a low CN ratio with a red tea that decomposes more, you know, more slowly because it has a high CN ratio and they're comparing these two, two different types of materials. But the basic idea is that all around the world we can get access to these tea bags and so everybody can do the same type of test. Okay, so let's just step, step back a, a little bit. At the beginning of this discussion of organic matter, we talked about the concept of humus. And for you know, many, many decades, people have talked about humus as being this very important component of soil. The fact is that the historical concept of humus is really being critically evaluated right now. This article, The Contentious Nature of Soil Organic Matter, came out in 2015, and it basically said that we've got it all wrong for the last century plus, that this concept that humus is these very large, complicated, stable molecules, essentially plant molecules that have been transformed into very stable humic materials, that basically that isn't what's going on. In fact, using the modern analytical techniques, what we found is the stuff that we have historically called humus is probably an artifact of the way that we get it out of the soil rather than really being a real material in the soil. In fact, in the next Soil Science Society of America meeting, January 2019, there's going to be a day-long special session focused on whether soil humic research has any meaning or value. And basically, there will be a debate between proponents and opponents, and there will be a review article that comes out. But th this is really interesting that the kind of the traditional way that we looked at soil organic matter and thought of humus as being the stable 
you know, most um, important part of the soil organic matter, may, maybe it was, maybe it was all wrong. Maybe, maybe it really was looking at a material that was actually an artifact of how we did the research rather than a material that actually exists in soil. Now, how does that relate to the products that are on the market today? You know, if we are critically evaluating whether there really is humus or the stuff that we call humus in soil, what about the humates, the materials that are being marketed into agriculture? This is a very interesting review article, Humic Products in Agriculture, Potential Benefits and Research Challenges, a review. And it basically, I think, is a very positive discussion about the humane industry, but it, it kind of lays, lays out a, a way forward that we can turn these products into something that is not, is not just snake oil, but really has a more reliable and understandable type of impact. They basically, these scientists, USDA scientists say that basically the, the humic product industry will improve when we learn more about what they do in the field. So there's new research being done looking at the actual mechanisms of how these products impact plants. And then also basically consumers will gain the ability to discern genuine products from fraudulent materials because there will be new types of testing, not just the traditional testing of things like humic and fulvic acids, but testing of the actual materials that, um, that you know, can be standardized across all the different products. But let me just give you a, a little bit of uh, insight into when you hear terms like humic and fulvic acid, we, we need to think about what they really mean. You know, it's, it's easy to think that humic acid or fulvic acid is something like hydrochloric acid or, or sulfuric acid that has a particular chemical composition. That's not the case. Humic and fulvic acids are solubility fractions, not specific compounds. I, I joke with my students that if we use the concept of solubility fractions, we could think of tidic acid production Basically, if you wash your clothes with Tide, what comes out of your clothes we could call Tidic acid because it's just a solubility fraction. Hopefully that makes some sense. The basic idea is that humic acid is a material that dissolves in a strong base but then precipitates when you bring the pH to 7. Fulvic acid is soluble in a strong base but stays soluble when you have a pH of 7. It's not, a, these are not specific compounds. They are simply solubility fractions that we have looked at in, you know, over the last century, but there's, you know, there's probably much less meaning to what these fractions um, have, have been, you know, claimed to mean um, as we look at the new methods of analyzing humic materials. So there is a new standardized method for quantifying these humic um, products, and I guess I would say if, if you are involved in this industry or you're thinking about purchasing these products for your farm, we, we need to make sure that we're getting an analysis of the products on the market us using this standardized method. Reputable companies should be able to provide analytical results for products, and if they can't, either you need to request that they provide it or they probably are not a reputable company. So I'm not presenting any specific research results on the value of humates, but my reading of the literature and discussion with some of the scientists doing this work is that there are some very specific effects that are probably, probably similar to plant hormonal effects where humate materials actually can promote better root function, can promote improved uptake of resources like water or nutrients. But these materials are not a substitute for good soil organic matter management. We shouldn't think of the use of a humate material as a substitute for improving our soil organic matter levels. But at the same time, we can think of these materials as having specific effects that are being discerned now using some of the new research methods.
Okay, I want to wrap up our discussion of research with a comment on something that basically I think everybody holds to be true. I, I certainly, before I read this, before I read this uh, review article, I, I thought this was true. Everybody knows that organic matter increases plant available water. But is this really true? Well, this is a review article out of Australia where, of course, plant available water is often the most limiting factor for crop production. And so they've taken a very critical look at the effect of organic matter on plant available water. And what they found after looking at databases that included over 50,000 measurements was that actually the effect of soil organic matter on plant available water is very small. Basically, if you increase soil carbon or soil organic matter by 1%, you only get about a 1% increase in the water holding capacity. Now that may seem significant to you, but if we think about a three foot volume of soil, we're only talking about <clears throat> a very small increase in plant available water. The amount of plant available water that probably is not functionally important. So does, you know, is that the correct interpretation of the data or is there something missing here? Well, something that I go to when I'm teaching about these concepts is the hydraulic properties calculator put together by Washington State University. It doesn't look at quite as many soils, but it looks at data from over 2,000 soils, and it actually comes up with a very similar interpretation. What this hydraulic properties calculator does is it allows you to change different properties and see how they impact the amount of water held in a soil, the movement of water in a soil, and other water-related properties. So this is an example here where I, I put in 2% organic matter on the left and 5% organic matter on the right. And I wanted to see how that would impact the amount of water. The increase in plant available water predicted by this calculator was actually just 10% more plant available water when we increased from 2 to 5%. But the increase in movement of water or permeability of the soil was 150%. The takeaway message here is that I think that, yes, building organic matter can increase the total amount of water held in the soil, but that's a small effect. The more important effect is that it increases the infiltration of water into the soil and the movement of water through the soil. Those effects are more important those effects of organic matter on soil water are more important than the effects on total water held in the soil. So in summary, the basic idea is that by building organic matter, especially organic matter at the surface, we can dramatically increase infiltration. So we capture more of the water that typically in the summertime it comes down in an intense thunderstorm. If we can capture more of that water, and we can percolate that water through the soil, and we can increase the depth of rooting, the rooting volume from which crops acquire water and nutrients, those effects are much more important than total water holding capacity in the soil. So if we really want to improve water availability to the crops, what we want is to have more water get into the soil and the roots grow deeper. And those are real effects that organic matter um, has been demonstrated to have. And those are much bigger effects than the effect of organic matter on plant available water. So let's try and tie this all together in the, the next five minutes. NRCS has long had a focus on something called the T-value. The T-value was the tolerable amount of soil erosion. And the general rule of thumb in the Midwest was that the T values were typically four to five tons of soil loss per acre. And so there were lots of efforts made to bring T values down to those four to five tons of soil loss per acre. And, and the fact is we've made great progress. 
these were, you know, these were valuable programs that tried to bring soil loss down to T. But the fact is tolerable degradation of soil is really the wrong way to think about managing soil. When, when we think about managing our health, normally we're not focusing on tolerable degradation. We're thinking about improving our health. And so the basic idea here is that rather than focusing on tolerable soil loss, we should be focusing on soil improvement. And the best way to do that, if there's a single property of soil that we can focus on, it is to focus on soil organic matter. By uh, building soil organic matter, or changing the quality of organic matter and where it's located, we can improve soil function. So we can focus on improvement rather than just tolerable degradation. <clears throat> so can we actually build organic matter in our soils? While the history of modern agriculture would suggest that it's not easy to do, the reality is that there are farmers that have been doing long-term conservation Dave Brandt is just one example, 40 years of no-till with cover crops, and he's brought about some very dramatic increases in soil organic matter. But that's, you know, that, that perhaps is an exception. What we need to think about is for each field, for each farm, for each region, what are the real opportunities? And the fact is that we, we are gaining insight into where those opportunities lie, where we should focus our attention. The fact is there are ways to understand the saturation of the soil organic matter protection mechanisms. If we have soils that are less saturated, meaning they are farther below what that soil can hold, we have a greater opportunity. We need to think about how our management interacts with the factors that are inherent factors, factors that our management isn't changing, like climate, like landscape, like texture. And we need to think about where the opportunities lie for creating greater use of the capacity for a particular soil. This is something that I think is still kind of early in its research, but we are, we are gaining insight into the role of microbial residues rather than just plant residues. And we need to understand how we can manage for greater production of the microbial residues because those are the ones that connect to the mineral part of the soil and become stabilized more so than just the plant residues. So in terms of the kind of the bigger picture of where the opportunities lie, the simplest way to think about it is where we have the most degradation of our soils, that's where we have the greatest opportunity. Where you see those light colored locations, hilltops or back slopes, light colored relative to other parts of the landscape, those are probably the places that will benefit most from practices that build organic matter. And that's not a complicated concept, but that's where you will see the greatest return on investment in cover crops. That's where we'll see the greatest return on investment in adding manures or other off-farm inputs of organic materials. If we can build organic matter where it's most been depleted, that's where we'll see the biggest response. And here we have a compilation of all the different sources that I used. Um, you know, this was a deep dive into research on the, I guess, the recent science of soil organic matter. I, I hope that it was accessible. I hope that it brought some new insights and obviously there's lots more to do to figure out this, you know, this basic question of if the microbial residues are what's most important, how do we convert plant residues into microbial residues more efficiently? And how do we do that in a way that of course is productive, gives us high yields, gives us profits. So balancing the green and the gold with a, you know, with a, I guess an insight that I've hopefully uh, explained clearly today that it's the microbial residues rather than the plant residues which are most important. How do we do that? How, how do we manage for using our, our limited resources to, to grow good crops but also grow more microbes and their residues that 
result in the stable organic matter. With that, I'll stop and I'll take questions. Perfect. Well, thanks so much, Joel. And we've got a few questions here. So the first one, when adding nitrogen to stubble to help break it down faster, are we just burning up potential SOM? That, that is a good question. I, th I think that the, the biggest control on residue de decomposition is environmental conditions and um, probably things that we do to create more contact between soil and residues. So laying our residues down on the soil surface rather than having them up above ground will have more impact on the rate of decomposition than adding nitrogen. If the environmental conditions are not limiting, you know, if it's not too cold, not too dry, then I think nitrogen certainly can be limiting and we, we can stimulate more decomposition um, in those cases, but by, by adding some nitrogen to the surface. I think the, the more important thing to think about, though, is what some people call the nitrogen penalty. The microbes tend to eat first. Microbes have more surface area, more capacity to acquire nitrogen than plant roots. And so our focus on managing nitrogen should be less on um, decomposing residues and more on balancing the demand of decomposition with the need for plant nutrients. And when we make nitrogen applications to high residue environments, our, our focus should be on providing the nitrogen that's needed to grow that crop in the face of the demand of residue and the microbes that are eating the residue. Hopefully that makes sense. I, I know I'm not you know, going into specifics there. I think that there are opportunities for nitrogen to, to be used as a tool to manage residue, but the focus should be more on feeding the crop, I think. And feeding the crop in a high residue environment may, may require different rates of nitrogen or different placement of nitrogen. Okay, thank you. Next question. How does changing climate, specifically extreme heat in my case, factor into this? Very, very good question. Um, I, I think that soil temperature does have a big control on rate of decomposition. Um, generally speaking, if soil temperature is 10 degrees higher, you have about 200% faster decomposition. So if we increase 10 degrees, we can have twice as fast decomposition. And I guess I would say this, this makes, you know, makes more clear than ever the value of having residues on the soil surface that moderate temp soil temperatures. Um, those residues, of course, can be an issue in the early spring when we're trying to warm up the soil or you know, when our crops would benefit from warmer soil. But um, the decomposition that's taking place when our soils are heating up during the summer is a very, you know, that's a very major part of the total decomposition during the year. And if we can keep our soils a little bit cooler or significantly cooler by having more residue, we will slow down decomposition and probably lose less of our soil organic matter. Okay, next question. If 75% of our carbon organic matter is returning to the air before it can get into the soil, does that indicate that early shallow residue incorporation followed by a cover crop may actually build soils faster? Or does the tillage release more carbon organic matter than what is saved by incorporation of fresh residues? Oh, that's, that is a tough question. I, you know, I think we have proponents of never till that are having great success with, you know, with managing their soils and building organic matter, um, you know, managing their soils for crop production and, you know, profitability, but also building organic matter. And we also have farmers that are doing some tillage, whether they be organic farmers where 
you know, tillage may be a key part of, of wheat management, or they be conventional farmers that are finding some tillage is helpful in, in residue management. Um, I, I think ultimately the, the riddle that we need to translate into practice is how do we turn residues, plant residues, into microbial residues? And I don't think we have a, you know, a complete handle on that, but I think that um, the, the concept that we just want to grow tough plant materials that will then accumulate in the soil, that, that's an old, outdated concept. The value of growing plant materials that are um, lower in carbon nitrogen ratio, you know, the value of growing legumes is important in terms of creating more microbial residues. And I, I think, you know, we, we still have lo lots, of, lots of research to do to understand the basic mechanisms and lots of translation of that research into, um, into practice. But some, some of the things that farmers have been seeing in terms of the value of growing legumes and brassicas, even though those material, you know, those types of cover crops don't have very persistent residues in terms of what you see on the surface, th those types of residues may, may be more important in growing microbial residues than, than we've realized. And so that's, you know, that's, that's where I think we're, we're headed in terms of figuring this out, that we, we, we need more than just um, tough residue on the surface. We may, we may need those residues for conservation purposes but we also need to have residues that are more digestible to grow the microbial materials. Okay. Next question. For that, con for that conversion of plant to microbial residues, does incorporation of grazing ruminants and cropping systems facilitate this? Oh, that's, that's a great question. I, I think that, you know, we, we know that animal manures are very good for soils. We, we know that animal manures feed the microbial community differently than plant residues, plant residues that haven't gone through a, you know, a digestive tract of an animal. And so I think, you know, a grazing system basically offers two opportunities. It offers an opportunity to get economic value out of materials that otherwise would be much slower to return economic value. So we're getting direct feed value or offsetting of harvested feed costs. And we're also getting greater roots because we tend to be growing materials that have more, more rooting than just our annual crops. And then we also are getting more manure returned to the soil. So all, all, all of those things, the direct economic effect, the ability to grow more roots, and the ability to um, add animal manure to the soil, those, those three things I think are all big benefits of the type of grazing system you mentioned. Next question, we've only got a few more. Could you talk about um, pea and its relationship it has with the bacteria and fungi to mineralize? Can we break down more existing pea and add less? Oh, that's a good question. Um, a, <laughs> a significant portion of the phosphorus in soil is soil organic matter. It's not as high as nitrogen. Nitrogen, we, the general rule of thumb is that about 99% of the nitrogen in soil is in organic form, whereas for phosphorus, it's more like 90 to 95%. But I think we definitely can um, improve our efficiency in terms of use of phosphorus if we can um, improve the cycling of phosphorus through through organic materials, specifically through the microbial community, um, and, you know, pr promoting the mycorrhizal type relationships, of course, improves phosphorus um, availability and uptake by crops. Um, but I think also the, you know, the basic process of phosphorus getting fixed or, or immobilized in soil can be changed by having more organic matter in soil. More organic matter basically reduces the amount of um, 
tie-up of inorganic phosphorus and makes more more of that phosphorus available. Uh, but the specific details of that, I don't think I have the expertise to uh, to comment on. But I think that that is a that's an important area of of research and and application. How how we can use phosphorus more efficiently through our organic matter management. Okay. Second to last question. How can cover crop cocktails influence soil organic matter increases in mineralization in a corn and soybean rotation in Illinois? Is there a best set of cover crops we should be planting? Oh, that's a great question. If if we're just talking about corn and soybean systems, we we have some serious environmental constraints. Environmental meaning basically um, temperature and moisture constraints on um, the amount of cover crops we can grow. Um, there are you know, innovative practices involving overlap of the time, you know, of the growing season of the cover crops and the cash crops, meaning interseeding either early or late, it gets more, more growth out of our cover crops. And there are some farmers that are finding ways to harvest their grain crops earlier to allow more growth. Um, but basically, every every day that we delay in planting our cover crops, we we lose opportunity, you know, to, to grow cover crops effectively, especially species that are not winter hardy. And so, um, the, probably the best way to use cocktails is to find ways to diversify out of corn and soybeans to actually have small grains that give us a much greater window of opportunity to plant these cocktails. But um, cer certainly th there are opportunities for cocktails in, in corn soybean systems and um, the best opportunities involve overlap between the cash crop season and the cover crop season. And I think combining in terms of the species, combining a brassica with a grass with a legume that's a very simple formula that I think has value. So you could say something like annual ryegrass with crimson clover, with with turnips or rapeseed or radish. Um, there, there are, you know, there are certainly examples of farmers figuring out how to make that happen. But we've got to get those species planted earlier if we want to, you know, to truly benefit from them consistently. We'll have an occasional fall where we can plant after harvest and get good growth, but on on average, we, we need to plant earlier if we want to benefit from species, especially species, you know, species that are going to winter kill. We need to allow them greater windows of opportunity to grow. Thanks. So last question, what is your favorite measure for analysis of soil organic matter? Uh, I think I, I'm somewhat partial to the permanganate method that I mentioned, sometimes called a test of active organic matter. I, I was involved with the early research that made that um, method more practical here in the United States. The original research was done in, you know, overseas, places like Australia. But to, to make that method more practical, research at the University of Maryland, Dr. Ray Wiles' lab, <laughs> worked on that and I was involved with that. Um, but I think measures of soil respiration are also quite uh, you know, quite useful. Um, but there's there are lots of bugs that need to be worked out to, to make the respiration methods more useful. Um, we need to make them cheaper. We need to figure out how to standardize the moisture content at which we incubate the soil. Um, ha having different moisture contents, e even if it's the, the same moisture content for different soils, that doesn't mean that you actually have the same moisture availability to microbes in the different soils. So somehow we need to come up with a way that we create uniform moisture availability to the microbes, and then, then we can have more reliable <clears throat> reliable um, interpretation of those results. I, I think we're, we're still a ways away from 
a test like the Solvita test being um, consistently useful for predicting nutrient availability. Um, these, you know, these methods are sensitive. They do tell us about differences in soils brought about by management, but translating those differences into changes in nitrogen management, for example, that's that's something where <clears throat> we we still have some work to do. I, I think we're we're headed in the right direction. Um, and there may there may be some other uh, other other ways that we can fine tune the respiration methods to make make the results more meaningful. Um, I guess while I think organic matter is extremely important, that that was the focus of this presentation. A little bit can go a long way. The fulcrum effect. Um, the the most beneficial effects that can be most easily measured are physical property effects, changes in soil structure, changes in water movement. And those may be what we should measure, focus on measuring more so than directly measuring the organic matter. The organic matter is the driver, but the, um, the effect that we can more easily measure might be a change in aggregate stability or change in um, water movement in the soil. And so those, that, that, that may be, um, if we're looking for simple, quick tests that have easier interpretation, it may be valuable to focus on the physical properties. Great. Well, that concludes our webinar on soil organic matter. You will find this webinar and other soybean and agronomic resources on the Chekhov-funded website, illsoyadvisor.com. Thank you for attending, and have a great day.